welcome to our first Heart Talks webinar of the year. I'm Selena Gore, the CEO of Women Heart, and I'm so pleased to be with all of you today. To those of you who are new to us, we are the world's largest patient-centered organization focused on women living with or at risk of heart disease through support, education, and advocacy. And we're really thrilled to be co-hosting this webinar today with the International Heart Spasms Alliance. They're an organization dedicated to supporting those affected by unseen heart issues. They serve both the patient and the medical community by educating, informing, and enlightening them to help achieve earlier diagnosis, better treatments, and more research in the conditions that we're about to talk about. These conditions include coronary vasospasms and microvascular angina. You may also know them as non-obstructive coronary artery disease or ischemia with non-obstructive coronary arter arteries, or INOCA. There are conditions that may not show up on the first round of diagnostic tests, but that definitely does not mean they're not real. That doesn't mean that they're not heart disease or that they're not diagnosable. What it does mean is that we need more awareness among patients and the medical community and a lot more advocacy. Clinicians need to know what these conditions are how they present, and how to diagnose them. It helps when patients are aware and can clearly explain the symptoms and advocate for themselves, because as we'll hear today, a journey of missed and delayed diagnosis, a journey where women are dismissed and receive too few answers in a timely manner, can be frustrating and worse yet, harmful. In 2021, Women Heart partnered with the Society to Improve Diagnostics in Medicine, to convene a group of experts charged with developing a research agenda on what questions we need to, to have answered, what inter interventions would work best, and how to truly move the needle on this diagnosis. These experts examined all sides of the problem, why women too often experience mis and delayed diagnosis of heart disease, and discuss solutions. And you can check out that final report um, on our Women Heart website. The conditions we're talking about today are very often included in that conversation about misdiagnosis. So I'm so thrilled that we have two medical experts with us to break it all down. Dr. Roxana Mehran is the Director of Interventional Cardio Cardiovascular Research and Clinical Trials at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. Uh, she's also a Wenger Award winner from 2018 for her excellence in medical leadership. And Dr. Birgit Vogel is Associate Director of Academic Affairs at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. She's also the first author on the Lancet Women in Cardiovascular Disease Commission, uh, which for those of you who don't know, Google that and look on the website and read all the articles because that is the latest and best information about women in heart disease around the world. And we have two patient experts as well. Annette Pampa, who is the co-founder of the International Heart Spasms Alliance and lives with coronary micro microvascular dysfunction. And Cheryl Zaworski, who is a women heart champion who also lives with microvascular disease. I'm so excited that both of them were able to join us today to share their journeys with you. So enough from me, let's get started. I wanna hand this over to Dr. Mehran and Dr. Vogel uh, to get us started. So over to you, Dr. Mehran. Thank you, Selena. Um, what a fantastic opportunity to be here with you, with Women Heart and the um, Alliance on Vasospastic uh, uh, Disease, and and to discuss uh, one of the most important and um, most overlooked conditions uh, that women face, and that uh, we really need to shed light to. Heart disease in women is the number one killer of women, but also men around the world. It is responsible for a huge, over half a million women dying on uh, women dying yearly from heart disease just in the United States. And it is not just in the United States, across the globe, this is an issue. It was for this reason that the Lancet, com the Lancet commissioned us to work on a consensus document across the globe to address the global burden of cardiovascular disease. Our topic today rests on a very important issue, a condition of non-obstructive coronary artery disease. Now think about that. When you're getting chest pain, 
we are taught in medical school that for the most part, this is from a blockage in the heart arteries that supplies the heart muscle. And so if you're having the chest pain, you come to the emergency department and there is signs and symptoms of what we read about that looks to be ischemia by the EKG, often these women or men would be sent over to the angiographic suite where an angiogram would be done. And that is where is the gold standard of diagnosing blocked arteries. And then you can fix those nowadays in 2023. And that's what I do. I'm an interventional cardiologist with a huge interest in heart disease in women. But often, and the reason why I became interested in this arena is that when I was a medical student, I was told with two patients, a man and a woman with chest pain, to go see the man first because probably the woman who's young most likely doesn't have anything. And in that particular incident, that day, I saw the man first who was having gastrointestinal reflux, but the woman right in the next stretcher was having a myocardial infarction. So these types of biases need to be wiped away. We need to absolutely educate our clinicians, physicians from the time that they're in medical school to pay attention to everyone with chest pain, but not to use biases of gender or sex to eliminate a diagnosis without even seeing or looking at the patient. But what's really difficult here is that most of the time, and if these women make it to the cath lab where we are looking at the angiogram, if we don't find the blocked artery, we say, oh, it must not be your heart. Not me, but that is what is often told to the patients. So then they leave the cath lab and they're like, oh, good. It's not an issue with my heart. My, there's no blocked artery. I'm good. Except that they're not. Except that they are at a high risk for heart failure or dying. And they're misdiagnosed. They're not been given the diagnosis that they actually have. And what are those two things that we absolutely have to uh, rule out? Is microvascular angina. And what you might say, what is that? That is where there is issues in the capillaries. Not something you would see in an angiogram, but something you can diagnose with the tools we now have, which is measuring the pressure and understanding what's going on down deep. And Dr. Vogel is going to go through that with all of you. The other is vasospastic angina. One that could be just paroxysmal or just in one or two episodes or one that can go on for a long time leading to a heart attack. And that has to be diagnosed by using some very important, what we call provocative testing, where we give drugs and we measure and look what's going on in the arteries that supply the heart muscle. And we see the spasm of those arteries completely closing down with provocation that could happen during a stressful condition. And if you don't have those diagnoses, then you're walking away misinformed, misdiagnosed, and you lose the trust and you are there feeling the chest pain, thinking it's not your heart, but that actually there is heart problems and a heart issue. So in my mind, if we don't start thinking and talking about this in a very open way, without filters, understanding that not only do we have to educate the clinicians, primary care physicians, obstetrician gynecologists who actually see a lot of these patients, and the patients themselves, so that they is never a woman who goes to a cath lab 
and has not been given a diagnosis. And you absolutely have to know if you are going to go through an invasive procedure, such an angiogram, and if they tell you there's nothing wrong, you must ask them, did you test for these other things? Is there spasm? Is there something with my small arteries? You don't even have to use the big word capillaries. My small arteries. Did you test that? And I think that is really important. And of course, why does it matter? Because now we're learning that there are some therapies that we can do for sure to improve the quality of your life. Taking away the stressors, some of the drugs that might work. And in fact, now we will be working very, very hard in absolutely designing clinical trials in women with these conditions to see what will actually work. How can we improve your life so you could live a life without fear and live a life that's full and long? And this is why we're here today. We're here to make sure that it is very well understood that this is an important issue. And if we are going to make a dent into the into reducing the global burden of cardiovascular disease, then non-obstructive coronary artery disease, which is more prevalent in women, which happens a lot, it's not a rare condition, ladies. It happens a lot. We see it all the time. It must be understood, diagnosed, treated, and hopefully studied further. So with that, I'm going to turn over to the first author of the Lancet Commission, which is a multinational global commission, which was sent to us. We were very lucky to be to be, I was very lucky to be the chair, to be told, bring everyone together and let's dig in. And by 2030, we aim to reduce the burden of cardiovascular disease in women. And let me tell you, I am a woman with a purpose and I will be working on this very, very hard. And it's not just me, it's an entire team. And we certainly cannot do it without women heart. And alliances such as the the, um, the um, Basospastic Angina Alliance and others, and especially the champions, the heart disease champions of women heart. They are the true heroes who are spreading the message, increasing awareness, educating our patients. And we absolutely will do this together by 2030. So I'll turn this over to Brigitte. Brigitte, Dr. Vogel, you're on. Thank you so much, Dr. Moran and everyone. I'm very grateful to be part of this webinar in this important matter. And I'm just trying to share my slides now. Um, hopefully you will all see it very soon. Okay. I hope everyone can see my slides. Great. So before I go into the background, uh, I want to give credit to the International Heart Spasm Alliance because some of the language I took from their website, they explain this condition in, in a way that is simple and very accurate. And so I couldn't explain it any better. So a little bit about the background. The heart is a muscle that continuously pumps blood to all the cells of the body to supply them with oxygen. To do this, the heart needs its own reliable blood supply. And on one side, that's from the large blood vessels, the coronary arteries that you see here on the right on the top. And then there is also an extensive network of much smaller vessels, uh, the micro vessels that you see uh, on the bottom uh, image. So during physical and emotional stress, the heart muscle needs more blood. And when the vessels are not able to supply, supply more blood, the heart muscle is starved of oxygen and the person may suddenly feel symptoms of angina. So we used to think that that 
is caused by a blockage, uh, it must be caused by a blockage in the vessels. And uh, in many cases, it is still assumed that that's the case. But um, then uh, if there's no blockage, uh, a lot of the times it is said, oh, uh, these symptoms, they don't have to do anything with the heart. You are fine. This looks all good. But now increasingly, we are realizing that there are other mechanisms that cause um, uh, reduced blood supply uh, to the heart and cause these symptoms. And they, uh, these mechanisms I will uh, explain in a little bit. But before I do that, I will uh, have um, a little bit uh, about the prevalence of the disease. So um, from this uh, study from Denmark, it is shown that the prevalence of INOCA is actually increasing, but it could also be uh, the case that um, it is just uh, many, in, in, in many cases, it's uh, more likely to be diagnosed. So 65% of these patients are women. Um, this is data from the WISE study that also showed uh, this is a only women uh, study. So in all these women that were referred for coronary angiography for chest pain, uh, it is 62% that have non-obstructive coronary artery disease. So the, the prevalence is much higher than we might even think. And then the second uh, question is, uh, what about the prognosis? Is this a benign condition? If the coronaries look uh, good, does it mean that these women are not at risk? And now we increasingly realize that this is not the case. They are at risk for major adverse cardiovascular events, which includes heart attacks, heart failure, or even death. So that's why it's so important to recognize these conditions. And this is uh, data that um, investigated the mechanisms of INOCA. And at least in this population, it was found that 51% were caused by microvascular angina and then 17% uh, by a vasospastic component. And there is 21% uh, that have actually both components and only 11% that they have other causes for their symptoms. So again, I come back to this uh, slide that um, is from an expert consensus document by Dr. Kunadian and, uh, and other experts that put these together. So on the right side, you see the atherosclerotic disease that is causing the, the blockage in the vessel. And then on the left side, you see the components uh, that cause INOCA. So I start with coronary microvascular dysfunction uh, because uh, according to that other population, that was um, the most likely cause. And we see that being a woman is actually a risk factor for that component. So in microvascular dysfunction, uh, the, the microvessels either fail to dilate, stay relaxed, or even constrict in temporary spasms. Uh, and in this way, the blood flow to the heart muscle is reduced. That's obviously a rather simplified way, uh, but the format doesn't allow that we go to in every detail. But also, I want to mention at this point that some of the mechanisms we don't even fully understand. So it is very important that we uh, do much more research on this. And we know that some components of it, uh, one of them is, for example, inflammation, but uh, it is not completely understood uh, what the mechanisms really are. So much more research is needed. And uh, luckily, it's also ongoing already. So we are we getting more and more knowledge about this uh, condition. The other component is vasospasm. Uh, you see it here. And these vasospasms, they can occur um, they, they at, um, at, in, in any situation, but they could uh, also occur at rest, which is very different from when someone has angina due to a blocked vessel. So they are transient, coming and going. Sometimes they can even last and they can uh, cause myocardial infarction and a heart attack. So these are the two components 
And now this is a very busy slide and I don't want you to be overwhelmed by it. It makes actually um, uh, diagnosis uh, look very complicated for this disease, but it's not that complicated. So for a full evaluation, a patient should go invasive um, evaluation, which means coronary angiography, so that uh, we look at the vessels and see if there is any coronary atherosclerotic plaque. This is very important. Sometimes it can so be so minimal that it can only be seen by a special uh, technique of imaging, but it will impact the treatment that these women or patients get. And then in a second step, it will be evaluated for the microvascular disease. And then in a third step, uh, it will be shown uh, if um, vasospasms can be provoked and if there is also a vasospastic component. So in the end, when you know what are the components and what uh, uh, is the patient, what type of INOCA is predominant, then that will impact the treatment as you see in, uh, in the right and left lower corner the treatment would be different depending on what components will be diagnosed in this uh, evaluation. And I just want to say a little bit about treatment. Uh, luckily, there are a lot of studies ongoing and our knowledge about optimal treatment is increasing. We don't have enough evidence yet that we can uh, have guidelines on this uh, condition. And it probably will always be a very individualized therapy for patients. And when you talk to patients, actually, I remember uh, our uh, web conference last year with the International Heart Spasm Alliance, then you can see that for it, it could be very different, the treatment, the optimal treatment from patient to patient. And so, but we are getting more knowledge and, and there is definitely ways to improve symptoms. So that the argument that, oh, we don't have treatment anyway, so we don't have to diagnose it, that doesn't count. And we should have a full evaluation for every patient. And now I don't wanna go into detail here about this paper, but this is also something that I can recommend because it sum summarizes uh, the condition very well. It's by Dr. Barry Mertz. Um, she says, this is a new epidemic. The prevalence is increasing. Patients are at risk. Uh, most of the times they are middle-aged women and men. So they are in full life. They are very impacted by their symptoms in their quality of life. They have, have stable disease. Uh, they can also present with heart failure. And they have persistent symptoms without obstructive coronaries, but evidence of ischemia. And um, I think the most important part for me here, she also summarizes the knowledge gaps uh, in the bottom. So we need to know the natural history of this disease. We need to know who are the patients that are most likely uh, will experience an adverse outcome. So who are the patients that we have to watch very closely and, um, and treat also preventively. And then uh, obviously we, le we need large uh, clinical trials. Like uh, Dr. Moran said, we will design these trials, um, hopefully also do all women studies to, to re uh, obtain the knowledge that we need to treat women uh, optimally. So I wanna summarize, um, it, this condition affects more women than men. It is not a benign condition and it is associated with increased risk for adverse cardiac events. And I'm talking about heart attacks, heart failure, and even death. And uh, diagnostic approaches based on detecting coronary stenosis often fail in women, which uh, contributes to a delay uh, or even misdiagnosis. So additional testing is required for accurate diagnosis, but often not pursued knowledge gaps about underlying mechanisms, prevalence, outcomes, and optimal therapy persist and must be addressed, and awareness about INOCA among patients and healthcare professionals must be raised, and that's why we are here today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Vogel. I learned a lot just in these last <laughs> 10 minutes, and uh, so I'm 
I'm sure that that's true as well for, for our audience. Um, it, we have some questions. I, I wanna just tell our audience, we, you have the ability to enter some questions in the Q&A section of, uh, of the, the webinar. And what I wanna do is hold the questions until the end uh, so that we can hear as well from, um, from our patients. Um, so let's move a little bit to hearing the story. So I wanna, hearing patient stories. So I wanna start with Annette. Um, Annette, can you tell us a little bit about your heart sore and specifically your journey to diagnosis? Hi, and thank you so much, Selena and Women Heart for giving us this opportunity to share voices. It's so important to be heard which is one of the things as a patient, we often feel we are not when we're in this difficult situation. So this is vital and amazing to all of our people that we represent. Um, my background story is, like you said, there's a lot of different, there's a lot of different kinds of patients. I was tepid, not a typical heart patient. So um, I was just turning 41 and I was a busy mom of two. I was an artist and an art teacher. I even meditated. I ran 5K every other day. I had a good diet. And one um, night I was just fatigued to the point of couldn't keep my eyes open at a very early state. And I'm, I was a night owl. And um, in days I couldn't read to my children. So all of a sudden I had no breath. I was feeling extreme fatigue. And I went to the doctor because of what was also happening was I was definitely feeling like my heart was being squeezed. I felt like a hand was like literally around it. Um, so my energy level was tanking. I was trying to get to doctors, went to my regular doctor and she quickly said I should go to a cardiologist. Um, did all the testing, which is, is what happens and it couldn't be my heart. He, he pretty much literally looked at me and said, you're just, you're too fit you um, attend stress, you're doing this, you know, it can't be your heart. I went through pulmonary testing. I went through extensive things that kept showing nothing else was going on and I was still feeling it in my heart. And I had no energy. My, my blood pressure was tanking, it was becoming really low. Even my resting heart rate was um, extremely low. And so also then they were afraid to give me nitro because you know, let's try to open up the vessels and just see if we can help the symptoms would be the next step if you can't see things. But um, with my blood pressure being low, they were afraid to. I found something online and shared with a um, local doctor that would finally listen that um, microvascular disease could very well be what I'm dealing with. And uh, he started me on, he gave me nitrostat. And so we, we started to try that. In the process, um, he pretty much would still tell me though that I think you're going to outgrow this. I, I think it's it's something that's going to go away, and it persisted and persisted to the point of I had no longer had a job. Um, I couldn't be stable enough at any day to still be an art teacher, and I lost many things. And I had found women online with similar symptoms and stuff at a a site, and we talked and one was an ex-cardiac charge nurse who had this and she said you need to go somewhere where you're going to be heard someone who sees this more often so my first was out to UPMC and I found a doctor who was involved in the WISE study and he said you know even looking at me with my symptoms and everything yes let's go further with the, the nitro and ongoing nitro like a, a, a long acting and see if we can get you more stable so the process though, this took, sounds like it was a short period of time. <laughs> it wasn't, it, it took a better part of uh, a year and a half, but that's shorter than some other people. Now this was back in 2010. So I had to often even go other places. I went to Georgia, Emory, I got help there um, further because just there were so many gaps at that time, 12 years ago in what people clinically were doing. So I, I did finally get help. Um, it just took forever and I had to be my own advocate constantly. Then, um, yeah, I found myself to be more stable, at least that I could manage my angina and my fatigue was getting less. Great, my goodness. I mean, it, just listening to you, I'm frustrated and angry on your behalf. 
you know, it's, it is it is a, an experience that we we hope happens less and less um, with our ability to raise some awareness. Um, Annette, can you talk up a little bit about how you came to start the International Heart Spasms Alliance? I mean, it is, it's certainly something, uh, a group of, of women so far, I've always spoken to women from the group, mm -hmm. um, who are passionate beyond, beyond words. And um, I'm sure that's, uh, that's due in part to, to your advocacy and leadership. What, what happened with me was I was feeling incredibly alone. I wasn't even on Facebook. Mm -hmm. I wasn't a person that ever used that. Mm -hmm. And then because I was also more homebound for months, I started you know, investing more time in research and finding out communities. Couldn't yeah. really find anything at the time. So I, I did my own Facebook support group. Through that Facebook support group, it gained numbers through time. And then I got involved with another Facebook support group that dealt mostly with, then they always call it Prince Metal Angina, Vasospastic Angina. And um, we combined forces, you know, let's get more, more right. people together. That was Terry Shoemaker and Cindy McCall. Uh, Terry lives in USA with me, Cindy's from Australia. So um, we also then gathered Sarah Brown, who's from the UK and we ended up, I was the last one asked to be in actually, because they were like, would you please join oh. us? And we need four at least people because we're all patients. We right. hope that one of us is in good shape when we have to make decisions and do things because we are people that aren't even always well and you know we needed at least four. So I was yeah. asked um, to come in on that. They knew about my advocacy and how much I wanted to get more word out. So um, that need for, you know, we knew we needed a, a website and more places to, to put information so that women could uh, pull things out that were real time research and backed up to um, share with their, their doctors so that they could not feel like, you know, it's just in my head or, you know, sure. Even early on, I got a lot of flack quite honestly, because I would pull up things. I found this on the internet and I, I get that that can be frustrating, but um, we, we had to start somewhere and it was still information. And I was pulling up research from the NIH. So how could they look at me and say, this isn't you you know, just because I had looked fit. Um, it, it, is, it is unseen in many ways. You can't judge a book by its cover mm -hmm. with, with patients and we are all very different. Um, so yes, that's mostly what we, we wanted to do, form an organization so we could have more resources. I think your right. experience, uh, Annette, speaks like so clearly about what many women are facing today, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and um, it really is amazing. You know, I was once told by uh, a really great mentor that you could never, uh, and we, we hear this all the time. Um, I tell this to my kids, you can't judge a book by its cover. You certainly should not be judging patients by how they look, how they dress, how they act, or how they don't, right? I mean, you know, um, and, and often those biases come in front of us. And we stop to see the forest from the trees. You know, we begin to, we begin to kind of assimilate in our own unconscious bias, a certain diagnosis that's associated with a young fit woman and putting coronary disease or microvascular angina or, or vasospastic angina to the bottom of the list and not digging deep. And I think what you're, what you're showing us is how, much this particular issue has um, changed your life, right? I mean, you lost your job. The, these are, I mean, when you're listening to this harrowing situation and with no diagnosis, you must have been going through a time saying, is this all in my head? Am I going crazy? But Absolutely. I am feeling these pains. Yeah. I, oh, feel it. Yeah. I can't do anything. Yeah. I can't breathe. Right. And, and, you know, I wanted, to, that. I wanted to believe the doctor too, that it wasn't true. I mean, there's a part of me, even though I knew I was trusting myself, you know, you don't want to have heart disease. You don't want to have a vascular condition. So there were moments early on that I'd walk out thinking, I hope he's right. I just, you know, I just want to, even because my blood pressure was so low, he put me on a potato chip diet, which what cardiologist would do that. Right. But he just wanted my blood pressure up and didn't know what to do for me. And I, you know, you're right. It's the way that it changes your life. And then when you're an active mom and, you know, 
halfway through your life. And I did do cardiac rehab. My cardiologist that I found local, that was great. He said, you know, I know you, you miss running and you love being active. Let's try rehab and see if we can get you somewhere. But even that obviously needs to be redone and rethought for this type mm-hmm. of patient. Yeah. So that, that's, that's a real big thing too. We would love help that's, um, you know, we, I'd feel safer doing it there because at least I've got mm-hmm. leads on and I can talk to people. The only problem also with this condition I've found is I often feel it later. I could, mm-hmm. I could feel great while I'm doing something and then the wall hits after the fact. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a real tough thing. And it's tough to get through your head because you want to keep doing things. So you need all this reinforcement, even though you're doing stuff and you think, oh, I feel pretty good. And then you're like, (laughs) ah, no, now I pay for it. Yeah. 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 Well, I want to bring Cheryl into the conversation. As I mentioned, um, Cheryl is a woman heart champion from the class of 2019. Um, And you know, the, the story is, is yet another perfect example, unfortunately. Um, so I'd love, Cheryl, for you to share your story. Yeah, so again, I want to say thank you very much for uh, inviting me to be a part of this conversation uh, for all the same reasons that, you know, for people even listening who might be experiencing some of these things as well. It's just so affirming for women who are going through these things to hear about and from other women who are going through these things. Um, And so it's great that we're doing this today. Um, So my story is very similar and in some ways dissimilar from Annette's, but it's definitely a story of missed and delayed diagnosis. Uh, So I had a four year journey on my timeline from experiencing symptoms to finally getting diagnosed. Um, Interestingly, kind of like in that, I was doing my own research all along and I, and I always kept coming back to microvascular disease or the WISE study or things that were related to that. And so in the back of my mind, I just always had the gut feeling that yes, this is what I have. Um, even when doctors were telling me, you know, no, there's nothing wrong with you. I just still always kept coming back and doing these same internet searches, finding the same symptoms and seeing myself in those symptoms. So that's a kind of a consistent thread through my journey, um, because I never really gave up, up on that possibility, no matter what was going on, even though I wasn't always acting on what I was seeing out there. Um, But during my four year journey, um, my first extreme attack was in 2015. I was sitting exactly where I'm sitting right now, working from home. Um, I just kind of dismissed the symptoms, even though they were extremely severe uh, chest and jaw pain symptoms. And I thought, I'm just stressed out. Um, I finally called my brother who is is an ER doctor And, you know, he's, my husband's name is Mike. And he said, where's Mike? He needs to take you to the ER right now. (laughs) And so that convinced me. And so off we went, Um, you know, I was pretty concerned at that point. Um, And then of course, um, long story short, uh, esophageal spasm uh, are two words that uh, some of us hate to hear um, because that's what I was diagnosed with. And it's definitely in hindsight, not what was happening to me that day, but, um, you know, no objective tests were showing that anything was wrong with my heart in the ER. And so, um, there was really no basis for them to give me a cardiac diagnosis. And I think there's a bias towards diagnosing in the ER. So I ended up with that esophageal spasm, which in my heart and gut, I knew wasn't accurate. But, um, you know, there I was. Um, So then I was working with my own doctor and he did, you know, to his credit at that point, he was sending me out for the cardiac workups. And um, like we've learned from Dr. Vogel and some of the other speakers, those tests are typically the tests that are going to tell us whether or not we have, you know, blockage of our larger arteries. They don't really address the, the small vessels much at all. Um, and so over four years, I would go again and again when I kept presenting with my chest and jaw pain symptoms uh, for the same tests over and over again. And they were always normal. And I actually think that uh, it, even a cardiologist was in 
involved at that point. Um, and I actually think that, um, especially for my internist, that just made him believe, you know, more and more that I did not have cardiac issues. Um, later, a few years later, I found out that he had actually diagnosed me with panic attacks and had never told me, but that was in my medical records. So um, a, a lot of women are told that they are having anxiety or panic attacks and then kind of get dissuaded from thinking they do have cardiac issues like we've heard already talked about on this uh, webinar. Um, so at least nobody was telling me that, but you know, later I found out it was in my medical record. And then that was confusing other doctors as well when they would see my record. But I didn't even know that was going on because he never told me. And that was extremely frustrating when I found that out. Um, finally, in 2019, I had a severe enough attack, uh, probably the worst one I've ever had. Um, and it actually awoke me from sleep. Um, like many women with these types of symptoms, um, they happen when I'm at rest. And this one was actually, I had fallen asleep on the couch watching TV. And um, it, I, I call that my literal wake up call because after that, I just couldn't ignore this anymore. And I just decided it's time for me to take, take the reins. And so I had already been doing, you know, four years basically of research about this condition. And so uh, I finally decided I was gonna consult some new specialists and that's what I did. And the following week, I was in the cath lab having a provocative angiogram that did diagnose me then with um, microvascular disease, endothelial dysfunction. Um, you know, I had the spasm uh, with the pro provocative test. And, um, it, you know, some people say, oh my gosh, that must have been so scary. And I said, no, that was one of the most liberating days of my life. Um, so um, that, that's kind of um, my journey. Um, my cardiologist, interestingly enough, um, as was referenced by our medical experts on this call, um, she was of the opinion that, you know, well, you might have that, let's not rule it out, but we wouldn't treat you any differently anyway. And of course, you know, we on this call know that that's not true. I am now being treated. Uh, you know, with uh, appropriate medication. And, um, you know, unlike Annette, I did not have early on issues with activity levels and uh, fatigue. That's grown uh, to be more of an issue for me now today. Um, what has been beneficial for me is different types of medication that I'm taking that help reduce my symptoms. But I will say that as I've even just been sitting on this call today, I still am having some jaw pain as, as I'm sitting here participating. Um, nothing that, and, and pain, I don't know, pain's a weird word, right? But, um, you know, I wouldn't call it pain, um, but it's just this kind of, kind of uh, presence <laughs> that I know is a cardiac symptom. Thank you so much, Cheryl. I mean, I am I'm really blown away just by how, you know, as, as Dr. Miran like sort of set us up with in the beginning, this is not rare. And yet I think the vast majority of people who experience it think it is because it, you go to the ER, you're told it's nothing. And I think one of you said it, there's some psychological relief when somebody says, oh, what you think is really a terrible, horrible thing is actually nothing, don't worry. And so we want to believe that. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think I think what this shows and I one of one of Dr. Vogel's slides really caught my attention that basically 90 percent of folks who experience these symptoms have something wrong with them that need that are worthy of investigation. Ninety percent, not 40 percent, not 20 percent, but 90 percent. So so I think that there you know, some it's really encouraging for, for those of us who might be experiencing unstable angina or, or you know, other types of, of um, heart symptoms to pursue a diagnosis. I think that, you know, if you were to go away with a message from this webinar today, it is to pursue a diagnosis. I know mm -hmm. we've got to um, wrap up shortly, but I just wanted to take a few of these questions and open it up to all of you. Um, hopefully we can address some, some, um, some of the questions that, that have been put out. Uh, it is a very active group 
we've got on this call. Um, and I want to say a special shout out to Peter because he start, he says, first and foremost, I'm a man. So thank you, Peter, for joining us. Um, one, the one question I want to throw out to the panel is, um, do, P, do PCKS inhibitors help with Inoka? Who wants to take that? So I wanted to just take that because I think it's an sure. important question. We really have no clear answers to what really, truly, and wonderfully works in uh, ischemia and non, um, non-obstructive coronary disease. Isn't that so sad? And this is one of the reasons why we believe these clinical trials like WARRIOR are so very, mm-hmm. very important. And we mm-hmm. at the Lancet Commission for the next two years will be culminating multitudes of trials that we're hoping to design in addressing exactly these issues. Now, yeah, the intriguing absolutely. aspect of the PCSK9 inhibitors and how they have been so effective in reducing cardiovascular out, you know, and reducing cardiovascular outcomes, especially heart outcomes of death, MI, CVA, heart, you know, dying or having a heart attack or having a stroke. These are in patients who have known obstructive coronary disease has been very, very well elucidated. Mm-hmm. In this mm-hmm. arena, we do not have any answers. Right. It, but, right. but it is an intriguing one because Reduction of the LDL cholesterol to the level that PCSK9 inhibitors are able to do does more than just reducing cholesterol levels. There are other things that are going on that we're not clearly understanding. And I think the idea of understanding whether there is some level of effects on the endothelium or um, especially for vasospastic angina, especially for a microvascular disease would be very, very interesting. So this is definitely one of the things we're going to put into our think tanks that we will have. And thanks uh, to Evan who asked the question online. And thank you very much for that wonderful question. And then I received several of these questions about a PDF to the Lancet article. And I think one of the things that I'd like to do, Selena, if you're okay, because I think it would be great is asking the Lancet to provide us with some free, um, free because there's a paying for, you know, there's a firewall and pay, payment, and we can see if we could get this to patients, uh, and um, and especially those who are coming through Women Heart. So that let me let us see what we can do. Uh, Brigitte right. and I are going to go to back to the Lancet and ask for a special link or a special. Um, way to get in and get um, these things to to the women of in your coalition, uh, and Absolutely. of course to the alliance um, to to the alliance of uh, vasospastic angina as well. We'd love to do yeah. that, so um, we will make sure it becomes available. Thank and you. Um, you. I wanted to say that Natalie, I sent I will be sending you the Lancet article because you asked for it and gave me your lovely email. But we will make sure that. Um, a women heart has at the very least access to these very important articles because you know what happens in there we have a top 10 recommendations um and of course uh uh inclusion of more women in clinical trials is one of the top recommendations sex specific evaluation of certain conditions like non obstructive coronary disease is a recommendation and you know a lot of these things are there in in the commission uh, thank you so much this is I think that's what everyone's been waiting for, frankly, is how can we get access to that report? So thank you so much. Um, that I think that's gonna be amazing. I also wanna say that the slides will indeed be available because this uh, webinar is being recorded and will be available on Women Heart's website after. So please feel free to share it far and wide. Um, we welcome you know, any additional um, folks that want to engage on this topic. Um, Annette and I um, you know, know that, you know. If we, if we can engage more women because they've had this experience, we want to hear from you. We want to engage you. And we want to also put our, all of our voices together to make sure that more people understand what, what we're dealing with here. Um, we, are, we are sort of coming to time, but I wanted to give each of you um, an opportunity to, in one or two sentences, give your best advice for anyone who, might, who thinks they might be experiencing uh, Pre-di- pre-diagnosis experiencing microvascular disease. 
Um, let's start just because it's you're on the top, Cheryl. Let's start with Cheryl. Sorry, I was trying to get off mute there. Um, so, um, you know, listen, I, I strongly encourage people to listen to their own body, uh, pay attention to their symptoms. Um, don't be afraid to ask a lot of questions of your doctor. And also you can't be afraid of getting other opinions uh, because sometimes that's just what patients with our types of symptoms and conditions have to do. It's sad, um, but it's very true. And, um, you know, don't be afraid to do your own research either. Um, you know, look up the words in the dictionary, search the words online if you don't understand them. Medical research is intimidating at times, but, um, you know, it's not um, totally incomprehensible to non-medical people. And sometimes it gives you some of the insights that help you push yourself to look for more answers. Thank you, Cheryl. Okay, one or two sentences, Dr. Mehran. So, um, thank you for, first of all, thank you, Women's Heart. What you do is so important, raising awareness, educating everyone, and then having champions to represent these very important issues. I would say the most important thing is for women to be intentional about when they're visiting their doctors, whether it's a primary care doctor or a cardiologist and they're having these symptoms, to be very, very, I don't wanna call it aggressive, but intentionally and very importantly, inquisitive about what is my diagnosis? Why am I feeling this way? Help me understand this. And if it's not obstructive coronary disease, then what is it? And how are you going to make sure that at the very least I have a diagnosis so I can understand how I can proceed and, and do better? I also want to really, really applaud um, centers that are investing in providing care for women with heart disease. At yeah. Mount Sinai, we will be launching the, the um, Heart and Vascular Center for Women, where we will be absolutely focused on many of these. And we will have a INOCA clinic very, very soon made available. We're starting with cardio-oncology and cardio-obstetrics because it's, they're really, really ignored. And this chest pain uh, clinic for women will absolutely be initiated because there's a lot more than meets the eye. So we are all committed and we need you as patients to also be just as committed as we are to take care of yourselves. Amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Mehran. Dr. Vogel. <laughs> So I think Dr. Miran uh, made really good points and I can only add that from my experience uh, talking to Annette and other uh, people that are affected by this uh, co condition, I think it's very important to connect uh, among each other because uh, so many people have so valuable experience that they can share and others can learn from that. And then all of a sudden, this long way to diagnosis can be much, much shorter when you already know these, these valuable insights that only other people that are also affected can give you. And then, of course, um, as Dr. Moran said, I think it's not always possible if you are in a in an area that doesn't have a center that is specialized. Maybe sometimes you have to take that journey and 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 go to the next uh, center that is specialized on women and heart disease. And I think today, I hope there doesn't there is no women's heart center that exists that doesn't recognize this condition and would uh, refer patients into the right uh, diagnosis pathway. Absolutely, Dr. Vogel, and, and just as somebody who lives in a city where we where, that we don't have really a, a functioning women's heart center, um, I live in Washington, D.C., there are plenty of women's heart champions among the cardiologists in the city. So I would say start there if you can't get yourself to New York City or to Cedars-Sinai in L.A. Um, Annette, mm -hmm. my co-chair, a uh, few words of wisdom. 
I highly recommend using the resources, your resources through uh, Women Heart, um, our website also. So that's International Heart Spasms Alliance. We have a ton of information that you can print out or use. We also have connections to support groups, um, about 4,000 patients from around the world. And like you've said, like it's so valuable. One of my opening, I welcome every single person that comes in and I say, here we may, all, we just wanna find our own individual management. We want to advocate for ourselves and seeing so many perspectives, you find clues to what may help you. And then you can be a partner with your cardiologist. And I know when I said to my local cardiologist, I feel for them as well. It's not, it's frustrating. If you're like an interventional cardiologist, you're used to fixing things, it is frustrating. We're a patient that, you know, it, it often you even have to start over. You start meds and you morph and stat, you know, life's not static, your health's not static. So I, I put my hand on his arm, my local guy, and I said, look, I, I just want a partner. I'm not looking for you to completely fix me. I want to be better. I just want to be better. So I was trying to take the stress off of him because I knew he was yeah. as frustrated as me. Yeah. And so it's not always that the doctors aren't listening. It, it, it sometimes is just like, let's get the communication better and, and right. know where we're each coming from so we can have a, a better outcome. Thank yeah, you, Annette. If I could add just yeah. one comment there to follow up on that. Uh, you know, I have a lot of medical people in my family. Uh, um, like I mentioned, my brother is an ER doctor. My daughter's in medical school right now. Um, my mom was a nurse and, and we've got more. Uh, I think the way I explain some of that dynamic is, you know, doctors don't get up in the morning every day and think, how can I misdiagnose or delay the diagnosis or somehow um, put an impediment to a proper diagnosis for a patient or my, my yeah. patients today? They get up and, and they want to help their patients, but sometimes they don't have all the information they need at the right time or maybe they've never had that information and that's why you know education is so important getting the word out on these things is so important so thank you again um, for sponsoring this today and uh, you know i look forward to many many more of these types of sessions i was just going to say this is only the beginning i really appreciate all of you joining us i appreciate how active all of our participants have been on on the Q&A and in the chat. Um, I will, I know we haven't answered everyone's questions, but I will commit to answering each of them after this session. Um, we'll come back and if, if we need to, to, um, to seek guidance from Dr. Vogel or, or Dr. Moran, we will do that. Um, thank you again. I hope this was informative. I hope you saw yourself in this and we look forward to seeing you on the next time. Thank you, bye-bye.